This is our annual webinar, which we do every year, sometime in December, sometime in January. And uh, this year, I'm super pumped up, excited to have Barry and Eric join us uh, for this webinar. They, we are going to be discussing what's happening in search, what happened 2023, what we can expect. And with that, I'll just go through brief introduction. I think everybody knows Barry and Eric, but uh, Barry is, he's a editor of Search Engine Land. He's also a founder CEO of Rusty Brick and uh, Search Engine Roundtable. But introduction I feel personally about Barry is, I read his news more than I read newspaper. So uh, our days don't start without his news. And uh, we don't sleep without reading Barry's news. So, you know, it's great, Barry, for you to join us. Thank you. And Eric, Art of SEO, he's an author of Art of SEO, a really good friend of mine, well-known expert when it comes to uh, AI content, technical SEO, and you name it. I still remember doing panel with Eric when we used to be much younger and wiser. Uh, or other way around. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much, Eric, for joining in. And I think everybody knows me, so I will not brag about my introduction and I will fast forward this. So what are we talking today? We will be discussing search evolution. We will be discussing latest algorithms which were released last year and what is the impact of these algorithm on search generative experience? Uh, what are the top trends? must have, and what are some key takeaway for 2024. Uh, before that, just promise only one slide about Milestone. Milestone was founded in 1997. We are today 2000 plus customers, uh, you know, digital platform and services. We work with a lot of big brands, a lot of SMBs, and we won some crazy awards uh, with five different verticals um, and so on. With that, let's get started. So last year we created this AI portal where we have compiled all kinds of information for businesses. If you are looking to understand what are possibilities of AI and we have series of webinars, series of articles which we have written. Uh, I normally write an article a month on search engine land and here is an article which was just released in December which is all about search trends and what are search priorities. Uh, feel free to review this and that's what we will be covering. I think last year I can honestly say was a biggest year when it comes to you know, various types of AI model from BART to chat, GPT to mid journey and you know, having fun, starting from having fun to really making use of these models to integrating these models in our day-to-day -day life. And that actually uh, put Google a little bit in an uncomfortable situation. And that's when Google launched uh, just in December, Gemini, a great model which could take your text and code and audio and video and everything together to come up with most comprehensive information. So to me, that offers a huge opportunities to business. It's goal for us to make sure every piece of your information is visible, readable, and discoverable. With that, I am gonna request Eric to do some Q&A with Barry. So let's get started. Let's go with our very first question. Sure, no, I'm, I've been looking forward to this because uh, I've been interviewed by Barry many times, so. It's nice to have an opportunity, as they say, turnabout is fair play. Uh, and, and Barry, I want to start by thanking you for all that you've done for the search industry for decades now. Uh, you've been a great influence and a great educator and really helped a lot of people throughout your career. So thank you for all of that. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure thing. But having noted that, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the biggest uh, algorithms released in the last year and what you see happening with the evolution of search as a result? 
Yeah, so I, I think the biggest one we saw in terms of what the SEO community even still talking about today is that helpful content update in September. Um, I think it was the helpful content update that Google uh, originally announced that they wanted to release. That was the previous helpful content updates were pretty weak, uh, but this one seemed to hit really hard in September and it's still people are complaining about it today. Um, with that the combination with like the hidden gems, like you're showing all these like Twitter and or now X, uh, Reddit posts and these YouTube videos and so forth. These things are coming up in combination with the helpful content update. It's really kind of like upsetting a lot of SEOs that thought they had um, what they needed to do to rank well. And then all of a sudden their websites are no longer ranking well and they're seeing all these like hidden gems showing up, which we'll probably talk about a little bit later. Um, so the help helpful content was probably the biggest update I saw. Then we had these like four core updates, which are always big. Core updates are always very big. But we had four of them, I think, in 2024, uh, 2023, which is big. Um, Google also announced the reviews, a couple updates. But Google also said they're not going to go ahead and announce future reviews updates. So that was kind of big. And a lot of these unconfirmed updates, which I report about a lot on Search and Roundtable, um, those were also very, very big. But I think the thing that will, people will look back at, like people look back at with like the Panda update and the Penguin updates, um, the Medic update and so forth, would probably be this helpful content update in September. I think it was probably very, very big. Um, that's my opinion. I don't know if you have a dis disagree with that, but yeah, no, I, I agree. The one footnote I would add is the notion of Google punishing sites that um, publish content that's not helpful didn't first start with the first announced helpful content update. I had seen instances of that previously with uh, with clients, but this gave them a. Uh, a way to label the concept and and uh, start uh, uh, putting some real teeth in it, and they're clearly evolving it. And it's a they found that it's a really strong concept. So, completely agree with you on that as uh, as being a, a candidate for the winner. Okay. Um, also, it would be great if you could uh, talk about these four different factors or or aspects here, if you will. Um, um, you know, at this point, you know, searcher experience, core web vitals, tech SEO, or helpful content. What would you say is the most critical? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I think most people would agree it's content. You know, you want to make sure your content is amazing, is helpful, is something your readers want to read. So I think content is always going to be the most important aspect of it. Even if you look at what Google has been saying, Google's always like, look at your content, look at your content, forget about the links, forget about everything else. The content is where you should spend your time. But of course, if Google cannot access that content, if your technical SEO is so, so bad, where Google can't even crawl that content, Google can't consume that content, then you have an issue. So yeah, obviously there's a fundamental layer of making sure that your technical SEO is good enough where Google can actually access your content and consume it and understand what that content's about. Um, and then obviously with all these the latest stuff around all the stuff with the Department of Justice and Google, all their documents being leaked, and you have this thing around nav boost and so forth, Searcher experience, obviously Google's been saying search experience is very important, the page experience is very important, but searcher experience and how they're interacting with the search results kind of makes you say, oh, wow, I mean, maybe we, um, maybe searcher experience is a, is a factor that we really should be looking into, uh, making sure that people want to click on your search results, people want to consume it, people want to interact with it after they go to your website. Um, I think probably the, the least critical is in this list is probably Core Web Vitals. They've been saying that forever. I'm very, I'm very like, I don't know. Um, I don't think it's something that people spend too much time on in terms of in terms of that. You know, everybody does it because it's a green. You want to have that green score. You want to have that 100 score. But I don't think it's that critical at all. I mean, content is always the most important, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that one. By the way, the the, the thing I want to note here when we talk about helpful content, you could translate that phrase and say content that helps users accomplish what they want to accomplish. That's what Google basically means by that. Um, and so it's really important to capture that concept. And we'll talk more about all that later. Um, so um, let's talk a lot, a lot about, or a little bit about WEAT um, and how important that is in, in, especially with everything that's going on with uh, generative AI right now. That's a good question. Yeah, especially with AI content. Um, obviously just to summarize, EAT is experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. Technically, there is no EAT or EAT score, um, so don't convince that, but obviously there's signals that Google uses that convey or kind of correlate with EAT. 
Um, and you want to basically write content that your readers want to read, um, that kind of convey that you have experience with that content, that you have an expertise. You might not match on all those things. And Google said the most important thing, I think, is the trustworthiness stuff in that area. So make sure that when you're writing stuff that your readers trust what you're saying and they can trust it through you conveying that you have experience, that you have expertise, that you have authoritativeness in that topic. Um, just don't publish content that you're writing just because you want to rank. Don't publish content because you want search engines to rank it. Publish content because your readers will love it. Um, and the good, good right. thing to say is like, a good way to benchmark that is if you lost all your Google traffic today, would you have readership? Would people go to your website directly? And you know, hopefully the answer is yes. If not, then maybe you're not writing content in a way that is considered EEAT. Um, and one last thing is I think that Google should add another E on top of this where AI really can't do it at this point is I think they should add um, something called entertainment. I think there should be an entertainment factor to how people write, um, how people um, build web pages. Just like yesterday or two days ago, The Verge came out with an article um, which wasn't so entertaining, but the way they actually produced it with these these graphics and stuff was a little bit more entertaining. Uh, it looked really bad for the SEO community. And a few months before that, Google came out with this, whole, I'm sorry, The Verge came out with another article, which is super entertaining to read. I was laughing the whole time, but it made SEOs look really bad. Um, and I think um, some articles you need to kind of add that entertainment factor. Um, and it's hard to do that necessarily with, with AI right now. In the future, probably mm -hmm. we'll be able to do it. Uh, but yeah, I think when it comes to all those things, you should really write content in a way that people will trust and people will be loyal to your to your readership. Yeah, makes sense. All right, SGE. Wow, I mean, like, how do you think that's really going to impact the the SERPs and things like click through rate and uh, and the like? Good question. So SGE is a search generative experience that launched about a year ago, um, it's been in beta or so, or actually probably several months ago, it's been in beta and it's still in beta. Um, and it's basically Google's new AI version of their search engine. You can opt into it going to search labs in Google, only works in Chrome and on Gmail accounts right now. Um, and a recent study just published in Search Engine Land by authorities says that 94% of Google's SGE links are, from, are different than organic search results, which is opposite what Google told me when they announced it. They said, the most of the links you'll find there are from our actual top search results. And this study says, no, 94% are not. Um, also, SGE is shown for 86 or 89% of keywords in the analysis. And also, SGE showed, for about, uh, showed about 10 links per answer, uh, but only four unique links. So of the SGE answers and the, the actual links that are shown, only uh, 10 links, but four of those were unique. And they school cited the same site multiple times. Um, and then our friend Bartos from Only, um, had another study a few months ago saying that SGE generated, uh, was generated for about 81% of all queries, um, which is interesting. And 67% of those AI snapshots were automatically generated without you having to click on generate answer, uh, which is pretty interesting as well. So SGE, at least right now, it's opt-in, you know, obviously play with it. It's important. See what they say about your brand. Um, see how it answers the queries that you're looking at. Um, and hopefully you are being sourced in there. But I think the sources are going to change over the course of the year or so. Uh, definitely before Google releases it. So you still have some time there, but definitely play with it. Um, it's hard to know the exact impact, but these studies do sh show that um, SGE does have a lot of links in it, but the links that are ranking really well right now in organic search are not necessarily what is presented in the SGE snapshots. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, okay, so KPIs and metrics that we should focus on in 2024. What are you thinking? I think that's really dependent on the business itself. Um, so, I mean, outside of like conversions and so forth, which everybody looks at, you know, content quality, we've been talking about content quality for a while. How can you measure your content quality? Um, there's obviously third-party tools, but also are people engaged in your content when they come back? All the stuff you mentioned before, that should be a KPI metric that you should look into. Indexation, like are, are the, is your content being indexed? That's another quality content measurement. If Google's indexing only 20% of your content, why? That's, that's, a, that's a measure, that's a, that's a pretty bad thing. It could be a technical issue, but if Google's able to crawl your website and they're still not indexing your content, there might be a quality issue with your website. Um, obviously, because of conversions, and I know Anua is very interested in, in pre impressions, like more around brand marketing. Are your, is your brand showing up in the SGE box? Is your brand showing up in the feature snippet box? Is your brand showing up for uh, certain types of queries? Because maybe they're not clicking over to you today, but maybe they'll remember your brand and contact you in the future. So those are all some metrics you should look into. Perfect. 
Okay. And what do you think about how AI or generative AI uh, is going to impact the way we organize our work and, and, you know, the organizations themselves? Right. Um, so as some of you guys know, I'm crazy into being efficient. I love using technology to make myself more efficient. I've been using Midjourney for creating images like crazy on my website. I love those images. And they, there's no way you could get a better image that conveys a technical topic. Um, like, I don't know, having a robot uh, writing a book on a beach. You can't really do that um, using stock photography, which is great. Anyway, but in terms of the organization, you probably need to generate a policy, company policy around how you will use AI for your company. Um, like, will you use in likeness of images? Will you use it at all? Uh, will you use content to write, write content? How much of the content will be written? Do you have to review it by editors? So you kind of need to kind of come up with a policy around that. Um, will you adopt AI at all? Will you block it completely? Some companies are blocking it. Um, and how could you use AI in different ways to make yourself more efficient? Um, you could come up with some prompts, um, a database of prompts that are useful for, your, for different divisions in your company. And obviously discuss this all with your lawyers to make sure you're doing this in a way that will get your company sued. In the future, of course, nobody knows what's going on right now. I know OpenAI is being sued uh, and Microsoft is being sued by New York Times and other publishers. You know, lots of lawsuits coming out right now with that. So you got to be a little bit careful, but have fun with it. Uh, and maybe do it behind the scenes in a way that you can make your company more efficient using AI. Yeah, and there's this concept of an AI-enabled uh, uh, worker that I, I uh, am very hot on. That if you do it the right way, you can take your subject matter expert employees and enable them to do far more. Um, and it's that balance of trying to do it in a way where you don't give up on the quality. In fact, likely will improve the quality in the process. So let's go ahead and jump ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, uh, and I know there are some Q&A coming. We are going to take all the questions towards the end because we do have some awesome information. With that, Eric, go ahead. All right. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of search. So let's dive in. So, you know, throughout uh, the, the past year, you know, uh, 2023, some of the uh, algorithm updates that... Uh, uh, we've seen, I'm not going to step through each individual one here, but, um, you know, generally speaking, I think Barry got it right, uh, which is ar around helpful content being probably the most uh, um, important one. But there were a lot of other things that happened uh, around the review updates. There were quite a few of those. Um, Google has said that, uh, and it's reasonable to believe that Pretty much most of their user, oh, sorry, algo updates since I would say March of 2018 or, you know, back quite a ways. Um, uh, we're focused on user intent and finding hidden gems is a part of that and topic authority is part of that and experience is part of that. But we're going to talk about all of that some more as we uh, as we dive in further. Um, so experience is such a big deal. Uh the AI revolution, the generative AI revolution that we're facing right now um, is one that really threatens the uh, um, really the quality of the web overall because of the scale at which you could push out content. And when you uh, use a, a tool like generative AI, which, you know, they, they call it hallucinations. Uh, I think we should personally, I think we should just call it errors because that's really what it is. It makes mistakes. Right. Um, and if you just push that content out and you do that for a year and then AI continues to consume the content and um, uh, and then publishes more stuff, et cetera, it just will get worse and worse and worse. So Google's placing a lot of uh, weight on experience um, and also uh, um, personalization into their products. Uh, um, is becoming incredibly important. And I'm going to talk more about that as we dive into it uh, uh, in some slides a little further in the deck. Um, and then uh, we've, of course, been seeing a, a rise in um, zero-click uh, uh, type search. Uh, so that's been increasing, and the percentage of traffic from search has been declining also but partly because Google gives more answers uh, and they do uh, you know other things to uh, you know steer the user you know towards YouTube or you know other kinds of things that uh, 
um, you know, don't uh, uh, deliver traffic to our site. So this is a universe that we have to be prepared for. Uh, I think it'd be very troublesome for Google if they take this too far. Um, I, I hope that they recognize that, um, but, uh, but we'll see, and we need to be prepared for this as well. All right, let's dive into some top trends. Um, you know, SERPs, especially on mobile devices, are getting increasingly visual, uh, and that, that's just a fact of life. Small form factor, you know, kind of a pain in the ass to spend a lot of time reading, um, and, um, you know, we, we kind of just want to um, get uh, get the information we want and get going. So, you know, here's uh, just some related data. 59% of searchers prefer visual information. Um, and, and so that's a pretty interesting stat. And then, you know, more than a third of mobile screens are completely uh, occupied by images, you know, that's inclusive of videos and maps and things like that. Uh, so this is just part of the landscape that we're facing. And it makes sense for Google. This is part of the process that they're using that personalize the experiences. It isn't making it visual for visual's sake. It's making it visual because users want that. And as the personalization wraps in behind it, it's going to get even more and more intense. So here's just you know several different uh, uh, examples. Well, seven different examples. Uh, you see SGE results. You see local listings changing. People also ask. It's not visual in the sense that it's an image, but it's you know a different. It's a break from the rest of the search formatting. So it, it kind of has a visual impact. And just straight images, of course, and uh, web stories and video. Uh, and then even vacation rentals. And there'll be more and more of this stuff happening. Um, so, uh, you know, the blue link doesn't necessarily disappear entirely, but it might. It might on mobile devices just because the push to create these engaging experiences is so high. And then, uh, you know, it was really interesting to see some of the other things going on in the SERPs too. Uh, so Google has been experimenting with perspectives in in uh, mobile search. Um, and so what that is, is a way that they have of wrapping in um, uh, other people's experiences in response to whatever the query is about. Uh, so you get Twitter and YouTube and Reddit uh, being the most common sources for this. Uh, but all of those places, those are real users interacting. Well, hopefully it's real users and not bots. Um, but, um, you know, the idea is for Google to be able to, to pull in real users. Uh, and as we see here, already on uh, more than 15% of news queries, uh, they're pulling in these perspectives kinds of things. And, of course, sports and entertainment are other great ways to do that. This is part of that more complex and involved response to AI of how they want to bring in user experiences uh, much more into the SERPs. And then just another example of something that's different is, uh, you know, testing uh, rental listings. There's a lot of businesses that are, you know, pretty prominent in the business of offering up apartments. So this could be a, a, a big uh, threat to them if they don't get involved in this uh, somehow. Now here we see that, uh, you know, apartmentslist.com uh, uh, is getting these listings. And then, um, so, you know, visual optimization, there's, there's a lot of things that go into what we need to think about here. Uh, but basically, a lot of what Google is trying to do is structure things so that the user doesn't have to keep doing multiple different searches and they can get everything they want um, in, uh, in their first search. This has a great bearing on what you do with your content strategy, by the way. And I'm going to talk more about that when we get to talking about helpful content in a little more detail. Uh, and, um, and, and so this is more uh, just another, re uh, I'm trying to get the right words without getting redundant here. Uh, it's really another way to think about how Google uh, is going about making these search results even more and more um, uh, diverse.
All right, let's talk about helpful content. So um, we talked about that during the Q&A with Barry, but um, content that is user first. So what does that really mean? Well, um, so for those of us who engage in search, it's, it's a pretty common practice to you go do your keyword research and uh, then you figure out you want to put it in the article from that and you uh, and try to structure some things in intelligent ways and, uh, and create something that's useful to users. But what if instead you talk to uh, your customers and you looked at your site search queries and your sales or product marketing or marketing people or customer service people and, and found out what the real customer concerns and issues were and what they were looking for and use that as a primary input and then took that keyword research to guide it, um, uh, you know, so that you're using the right phrases and things, um, both for user perspective and uh, SEO perspective, uh, you might find that you're going down a path that has a longer term viability with the way Google is evolving. You also need that strong uh, WEAT, a particular experience. Um, uh, by the way, to the question from Lisa that popped up, I am going to talk more about WEAT in a minute, uh, so bear with me. But um, you know, the experience is a big deal for Google, and I already mentioned it before, but it's worth reiterating that we just don't want um, AI to take over everything, and Google is doing a lot to make sure that they reward sites that really highlight actual user experience. So the, the three steps really quickly, um, you know, you gotta go through and identify what the right things to write are. And, you know, understand the audience, the intent, the topic, do the kind of research I talked about, find the competitive gaps and opportunities and what's performing well and what's not, and create that map of things that you wanna work on. And then you need to go through a content generation process which is designed to, um, you know, basically get you uh, uh, high quality content, and then you get to measure the success of that and keep looping around and around and around. Um, so, uh, with that, let's jump ahead. Um, so, I do want to mention I kind of covered the first two points of this already, and I want to make sure that we get through all the sides. So, uh, but I do want to highlight this third one. If you are gonna use AI to assist in generating content, and I'm a fan of doing that, but only if you have heavy human involvement and humans um, own the final output, uh, the quality of the final output, ideally a human whose name appears on the piece of content so that they have some ownership around it. Um, so that's the way I would approach AI and generated content. So let's jump into engagement and experience. So there's a whole set of different uh, kinds of contexts to think about. Um, and I'm not gonna cover all the bullet points underneath, but I do wanna cover the concepts here, which is, you know, people have you know time when they're just looking for information. And then people have times when they wanna go somewhere. And then they have people a time where people want to do something specific, like a how-to kind of thing. And then people want to buy. And this is just four examples of, of different types of mindsets that people will have during the customer journey. And you need to bear that in mind if you create your content plan. Awesome. I just wanted to chime in. Somebody asked, what is a user-first content? Really, user-first content is which is created for those moments, right? So just wanted to add here. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, and ultimately, what Google wants, what they're trying to create with their own search experience, we already talked about it, trying to minimize the number of clicks that uh, users have to go through to get what they want. Well, they want us to do that too. So imagine your website can consist of four classes of pages. One, call it a head term page or a top page. So that's a single page. And then maybe there's eight category pages underneath that that I'm calling second level pages here. And then 20 long tail pages, which are more specific questions um, that they have. Uh, and then 50 very long tail pages, which are very specific questions, even more detail oriented. Um, and, and, and so these numbers are all artificial just for the example here, but imagine your top page 
is, is, is really good and 11% of users who um, visit it are satisfied. That's actually an outstanding result for a head term page, by the way. Um, and, and so that's okay, but you're leaving 89% you know, uh, of users on the table. So then you create the second level pages. Let's say that each of those satisfies 3% of users. So cumulatively, the eight satisfies another 24%. So add that to the 11, and now we've satisfied a little more than a third of users. But still two thirds we're ignoring. So then we create the long tail pages to answer even more specific questions. And maybe each of them you know, answers maybe less than 1% each, but it's cumulatively another 18%. And now I get to more than half of users and then very long tail pages. I won't go through all the math in the same detail, but I create them all, another 50 pages. Um, and, and I'm finally to more than two thirds of users. So the reason why I'm drawing this pyramid out for you is, um, first of all, the numbers are artificial. For you, the long tail pages might be 10 uh, or it might be 100, depending on the complexity of your topic. Um, so, um, but... Google is trying to understand when they send someone to your page and your site, what percentage of users are likely to be satisfied upon arrival at your site so that they don't end up having to click back and go onto somebody else's site. So that's important to understand. So a big part of that though, an additional part of that is how well are you engaging the user? So, um, you know, Everybody wants or needs something. It should help. You should help them achieve their goals, of course. Um, and you need to understand how they're interacting with your content and um, optimize the experience in your site so they have a better experience. Then, on the other side of things, um, in terms of experience, uh, we want both user generated experience and insights from experts. This is also part of Google's response to AI. So let's move on, please, and talk about personalized user experience. So Google um, is moving down the direction of making their site, their search engine, much more experiential and interactive and personalized to each user. Uh, and that's a big thing that is a major focus for them at this point. So um, you, you see, you know, just some examples of things here. That's part of the reason why search is becoming visual, but it's also imagined that all of these things like the particular images and videos being brought up are being contextualized based on what's been clear that you have more interest in. So if you have particular music artists that you love and you're constantly listening to their music on YouTube, um, you know, you might see more of their videos appear where appropriate contextually uh, in the search results. Um, and they even had at one point an experiment they did around a thing called simple search, which they never clarified what it was and never even officially admitted that it was there. But you could imagine that Google could even have an option for somebody who says, you know, I just want the simplest possible answers. I don't want all the detail. I just, you know, give me the three sentence answer. And that, you know, that could be the direction that they were headed with that. Another cool thing about the personalization, by the way, when we adopt that on our own site, first of all, we're aligning what Google is planning to do with their site or their search engine. And that will bode well for our participation in their search engine. But it's also really good for improving engagement on our site and conversions. And those are incredibly important. You know, conversions is where it's at at the end of the day. Uh, we, are, we are here to, to feed our businesses. So I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, multi-channel strategy too, because, and by channels here, uh, what I mean is, think of search as having been broken into many different channels. So we have to play in videos, right? We have to play in images. Uh, and want to play with FAQs. We want to be in people also ask. Uh, if if applicable, uh, we want to be in news and articles um, and then webinars. It's like, so we want to optimize the, the customer journey with the nature of the content that we create uh, and the way that we engage with our customers. And we want to make sure that where there's opportunities that come up 
uh, within search that we uh, are there with content to be shown in, in that part of the search results. So big changes coming up and we got to get in line. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So let me take these few trends. So I know there are a lot of questions coming in. So just a few more minutes, we'll wrap this up and then we'll take all the questions. So few other trends is enhancing local strategy. What does it mean for location-based businesses? It's not about listing anymore. It's about being inspired for what your audience are looking for in your local space. For example, Facebook marketplaces, both my kids use stuff like crazy, right? From renting apartments to buying all the stuff on Facebook marketplace or user-generated content. Um, you know, a lot of brands are using a lot of UGC content to bring authentic connection with the brand or even doing inspirational TikTok and Instagram video, right? As much as I try avoiding these two channels, these channels are actually becoming stronger by the day for small businesses, for location-based businesses. Uh, in fact, if you think about the content, what's trending in your, in your local area? So Google has this great, awesome tool where you can go in and find out exactly what's trending. What's still trending in San Francisco Bay Area is air quality and Taylor Swift, right? It's, it's, uh, and once you know what your consumer, what your customers are looking for, what they're expecting out of your brand, then creating various types of assets or various types of helpful content enables you to build that authentic connection with your customer. Right. So here is a study which Moz has released last year, and they talked about the ranking factor for local business stands from GBP signals, loss also on on-page signal, review signal, everything around trust, how accurate information you can give to your customer right away. In fact, one of the latest update GBP launched, uh, oh. Google Business, um, profile launched was your hours of operation, if they're open or not. It was just launched like three days back. Or they also launched doing web stories within GBP. So again, more interaction, more personalization, more reviews. It's very little if you see right here, local listing, it's like 7%, but a lot of it is just quality of your, quality of content you are sharing with your customer. So our suggestion is when you are creating your local land, local strategy, understand what, what your customers are looking for, what kind of amenities, what kind of FAQ, study schemas, ensure you have interaction, engagement, like Barry talked about, the entertainment factor, including all of those elements as part of your landing page or your uh, experience strategy really helps in conversion. With that, to me, Local 3.0, I changed this a little bit from last year to this year, is all about good quality content. I know some of you asked about what, what, the, what do we mean by UGC or helpful content? It means you know, what your consumers are looking for, right? So if, it's, if it is a home store or if it is a you know, big, big automotive, they might be looking for used car inventory. So let's start doing some videos around that or, you know, what are the various things to do in the area? A little bit less around brand, but more around what consumers, consumers are looking for in the local area. With that, I'll go to the next one, which is brand mention and social proof. This is something brand new we added this year. And it is, it is actually having, you know, we can see big impact on your uh, authority of your domain, which is really how you are connecting with your customer, with your influencer. Here is a brand which I was kind of researching when I was researching for this, I found that they have done a phenomenal job in interacting and engaging with their influencers and uh, having them share stories, right? And it works for a lot of businesses where you have some awesome, you know, your customer, enable your customer to create content for you or enable your, enable influencers if they're going to, they are coming to your, 
your location, enable them to create content for you, right? So that's where customer testimonial, influencer marketing, celebrity endorsement, all your reviews in creating a platform which enables all, all the community folks who are talking about you to uh, be together and discuss uh, and sharing their latest and greatest. With that, um, you know, what I would say is brand mention and social proof, they are not direct ranking factor, but they are absolutely indirect ranking factor. They helps with authority and trust. Uh, absolutely understand what your customers are looking for, what question they are asking to create that those long tail content strategy and find ways to be mentioned on well reputable sources, right? Reaching out to your PR company or relevant influencers and things like that. Now, you know, with all of that said, how do you prioritize, right? It's, it's really always 80-20 rule. How do we do less with maximum impact? So the way we categorize this is number one is your foundation. Number two is looking at right metrics. And number three is enabling your company and your organization with AI enabled workforce. And that's what Eric also shared with us. So with number one, technical SEO and infrastructure, because you can have amazing content, but if you don't have right infrastructure, right platform, this content is not coming together for maximum impact. In fact, John Muller, uh, for folks who don't know John Muller, he is a voice of Google, just released a great uh, video just three days back. And he talks about four takeaway. Number one, technical SEO. Number two is heavy focus on search quality algorithm, which is again, AI helpful content. A lot of it is helpful content reviews and experience. Number three is embracing. Google is saying embrace AI and machine learning, but be mindful of its usage towards experience. And number four is structured data. Ensure what you are putting out there is available, is discoverable. With that, here is a nice, uh, you know, foundation element which you can create from crawlability to indexability to relevancy to popularity. Getting your foundation strong is a is a key for you to build strong overall 2024 strategy, um, digital strategy. And with that, I would also say having your scalable architecture, having very very strict focus on uh, you know, security, compliant, and how you are scaling your infra for various types of customer through CDN or, uh, or for multi-language and things like that. Uh, number two, let's look at new metrics. This is an article actually I released sometime in November where I, I kind of discussed about latest metrics and latest metrics is just not conversion. It is visibility. These are engagement and conversion. If you want to know a little bit more about this, please do go to Search Engine Land or Milestone blog and there is an entire article on SERP, future-proofing SERPs. So what are the visibility metrics, impressions, search results? What are engagement metrics? How are you, uh, uh, you know, you scroll depth, time on the site? What are the conversion metrics? Uh, how, how people are converting to you? But if you are in an organization only focused on conversion metrics, then we are missing top of the funnel uh, activity. So do in, include these as part of your overall strategy. Now, with that, I think biggest challenge marketers are gonna face and they need to resolve it is, how do you create your platform, your solution, which are easily scalable, right? You cannot be putting these metrics in silo. You can't put organic metrics with paid met without paid metrics. And how do you make sure it's easy, your reports are easily, adjustable, digestible, right? Uh, because consumer patterns are changing constantly. New metrics are being 
released constantly, old metrics are deprecated uh, constantly, and it's not possible to just keep doing all of that within your platform. So what our recommendation is centralize all of this, centralize all your information in a in almost like an elastic format so that you can create your dashboard business based on your business goals rather than just uh, standard metrics which are constantly changing. Uh, with that, I am going to wrap it up with one or two more slides that AI enablement is it's a culture. It, it takes, uh, you know, enabling your team members, enabling your product, really bringing that awareness and knowledge is super critical for organization in 2024 and, of course, was there in 2023. So here is an example I will give you is, you know, one of our favorite offering, which we released sometime last year, where within our content management system, our digital asset manager, we integrated that with AI and able to give a quality score. Now, it was an amazing feature. Anybody who got it saw some crazy return. But there was just so much effort had to be put in to bring all the images from file folder to uh, cloud and then bringing awareness and making sure all the teams are coming together to, to understand what it is and able to communicate impact of what we have built. So really point here is that there is a huge evolution of what people are doing or they were doing before, right? Uh, if you see content writers today are becoming prompt engineers and content strategists. Your SEO, SCM, marketing folks are becoming data analysts. And you, as an organization, you must have cross-functional goal. You got to get your leader's hands dirty and understand exactly what problem they are solving because these problems cannot be solved within one department because entire definition is changing constantly. And aligning organization with common goal, having common goal is a key because, uh, you know, everybody, most of us are still working remote. And if we don't have this common goal, it is hard to bring that efficiency. And that's a, that's a leadership challenge as a company we, we need to solve. Uh, I know, Eric, you have talked a lot about AI-enabled worker. You want to chime in here? Uh, yeah, no, it's incredibly important, to, uh, as Benu suggests, to, to understand how to wrap AI into your, your broader organizational strategy. Um, she had a bullet point on there that, you know, people who are AI, workers who are AI-enabled um, will take the jobs of people who don't learn how to work with AI because, and that's where the real threat is, but, um, you know, to people in their jobs and, you know, don't, don't panic, just take the, the time and effort to learn a little bit about uh, uh, how to use the tools effectively in your job. It's not a situation where it's going to replace humans entirely, uh, not at least at this point. And I think we're a ways away from that yet. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we'll just take one or two more slides, close it up and open up, open it up for questions. With that, number one, there was a Forrester report which was published, uh, you know, just early part of this year, which talked about by end of 2024, search engine will be measuring impression, not just click. It's going to be all about rich media. It's just not going to be all blue links. Uh, number two, connect your, you know, marketer must connect all your channels. Having one team do your SEO, another team do your SEM and not leveraging co-optimization strategy is not a smartest business decision anymore, right? It was never a good decision, but now going forward, SEO and SEM is all integrated. Uh, Connecting your customer journey and understanding what your customer pain points are to create your content strategy is going to be pivotal. Making sure you're using right metrics, right? Because right metrics is going to help you make right decision and enabling your organization to align would be also really critical to use to leverage AI effectively. 
With that, I am gonna open it up for Q&A. I think there are just a few more questions. There's some awesome webinar coming in. There is a webinar we are doing with Conductor. So please sign up. There is a webinar coming in with our partner Sojourn, which is, uh, which is you're gonna be hearing more. And again, there is hubs of awesome information. So please do, uh, if you need anything, please do let us know. And then again, if you are looking for some input or uh, input or guidance, feel free to sign up. With that, let's open it up. Open it up for question. What is the title of Forrester report? We will share that with you. Deborah, thank you so much. You have asked some really awesome questions. So yes, uh, Deborah, if you don't mind, share that. Um, uh, our team will take that and we'll share a report with you. Uh, let's take a few more questions, if it's okay, Eric, uh, let's just, opening hours for GPP is still very much disputed, depends on industry and area. Yes, I agree. I think it's just point I was trying to make that Google is constantly testing various types of features in their search. Okay, um, let's take a few more. Uh, Eric, you want to explain what, what EEAT stands for? Uh, sure. Uh, experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. So the experience just relates to real-world experience being involved in creating your content. That means user-generated content or expert, your subject matter expert uh, or guest experts contributing to your site. Uh, creating great content. Um, so that's the experience part. Expertise, well, I, I kind of just alluded to it when I was talking about experience. Some of your experience may come from experts. They want to make sure that you're bringing real expertise. Well, Google doesn't want you just to regurgitate information that's already out on the web. They want you to bring something new and special. And that's what they run a re reward. Um, authoritativeness, that's a... Um, you know, we can associate that with the notion of links, although I'm sure Google has other elements that they uh, include with authoritativeness. But um, uh, that's something that Google did is they turned the dial back up, we believe, on the weight of links in response to, um, you know, protecting themselves from a, a surge of um, AI-generated content. Um, and then trustworthiness is really kind of what are your motives? You know, are you someone who uh, is gonna take care of the customer in a good way when they come to the site, um, or you know, are you gonna bait and switch on them or do other things that would say that you're untrustworthy. So you wanna be good at all those things. Um, as I believe it was Benu said earlier, it might've been Barry, it's not a signal that Google measures directly, but they look at other signals that help them understand how you address EEAT. Awesome. I think there's a really good question here. Um, are results that appear in SGE attributed to organic KPIs? Uh, you mean, are they trackable in? Uh, I think that's yeah. what they are. Are they trackable? I'm not 100% sure on that one, Benu. Maybe you know the answer. No. Yeah, we would have to get back to people on that one. I don't think they are but um, I'm not 100% sure. No, it's not trackable. They have not released because SG is not, it's there. Well, it's not but... released. Yes, that's true. Yeah, but, so they have not released it as part of our, part of So the real hand. question is, will they be trackable once SG fully releases? Yep, yep. In fact, it's really funny. Just three days before, or I think last week, Google stopped giving quality of URL or page within search engine, with the um, uh, search console, right? So what I'm assuming that they are just pivoting towards more around SG's result, but let's see when they are gonna release SG, that's when they are gonna, we will know what KPI. But it still is important, you know, it's important for us to know where your business is sourced and which sources and which channels are getting attributed. Okay, uh, there is another question. What does zero click mean? Um, Eric, you wanna take that? 
Sure. So um, what zero click refers to is when someone does a, a search in, in Google um, and they don't click any of the existing listings um, that come up or, or, you know, on page elements that come up, none of the images or videos or whatever. Um, and they either just go away, they were completely satisfied or they enter a new search on uh, something else or, um, uh, you know, or they get their answer directly from Google. So um, that's what zero click means. So we, we talk about zero click searches because it means that it's traffic that's not available to us from those search queries. Wonderful, thank you so much. I think um, I would, okay, Brian, I would look at same YouTube videos for, okay, what are first few items someone should use to start understanding AI and its application? First few items to understand about AI, I'm sorry. And its application. So oh, I think yeah. it's what are some of the use cases for AI? Yeah, so there there's a lot of different use cases actually. Um, what what AI generative AI in particular? So talking Chat GPT or Bard or uh, or even Bing Chat. Um, uh, you know they're they're really good at surfacing ideas and information. Um, what they're not good at is that the information is often not accurate or complete. Like if you, you would really pretty much never generate an article with your generative AI and publish it without some human looking at it, because it probably wouldn't be very good. It's extremely good chance it wouldn't be very good. So, but if you have a subject matter expert and you use it to generate outlines for them, it can help the subject matter expert get started on creating the content. Because you know, here I have an outline and say, oh, that's a pretty good starting place for the outline. But then they'll go, oh, it's missing this and it's missing that and do a little research and they make it better. But it helps them get started. And it's always easier to be an editor than a creator from scratch kind of person. And it's very powerful at that. And that's something that you can use in many different ways in your organization. Awesome. Yeah, you know, literally in our organization, from our engineering, engineering to our website to QA and you know, marketing, pretty much everything. In fact, one of the yeah. experiments is super, I'm super excited to see the result of it is how do we use AI even for our L1 support, right? So how do we take all this awesome data we have it available? and then use AI to answer a lot of those questions. Uh, you know, it's really sky's the limit. We, we, are, we are bringing, uh, you know, mid-journey integration or image ability to create images in the CMS. Um, there are just some amazing use cases for AI. So only thing I would say is absolutely making this a necessity. necessity. I think we are almost, almost done. Uh, I guess, Eric, do you have few, you know, a few things you would like to just wrap it up, one piece of key takeaway for audience, um, then we can no. uh, thank uh, everyone. Absolutely. Go ahead. So, um, you know, we, we talked about many different aspects of how search is evolving and how Google's evolving, but the key thing is how do we need to evolve? And we tried to talk a little bit about that too, but whatever you do, keep getting back to what's gonna create the best experience for the user. Um, and if you do a great job of that, uh, and of course you do the tech SEO you have to do and you promote yourself well and those kinds of things, uh, your chances of doing well in Google um, are, are much better. And it's for those of us who come from a raw search marketing background or SEO background, that's not the way we're necessarily oriented to think. But it's the way we need to think going forward. And it's really important for you to do that. Because if you don't do that, you're going to get behind others who do. Awesome. And I would only say is uh, within the organization, make sure your teams are gaining those T, becoming almost like T-shaped marketer. Right? You can be really good in one thing, but you have to have enough 
enough skills to and and you know opportunities to understand what's happening in other departments to solve customer problems because customer problems are changing constantly. It's not just like Eric said, talking about AI generated content. What should we be writing about? And is it really performing or not? And how do we really take, uh, you know, the content, content writer problem today is not to create content, is to make sure the content which is created is working or not. And that requires a completely different skill. It's not a writing skill. It is more of more of an analyst skill. So as a leader, yeah. enabling or bringing all the organization, bringing everybody together towards those goals is a critical thing. With that, I think we are almost dot 11 o'clock and we, we do have a few more questions, but we will take these questions and share it, share answers with you. If you have any other suggestion for our upcoming webinar, please do let us know. You will get the recording. You will also get slides. And there is going to be a white paper, which is going to be written with all this great insight. So thank you so much, Eric, for joining us. And of course, thank you, Barry. He literally had just a few minutes of his time. So I'm glad he managed to join. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. Some, you know, some awesome insight. And folks have joined in from all over the globe. So thank you for staying up in the night or if it's middle of the day or late in the night. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year. Thanks a lot. All right.